We have about a quarter of an hour for some questions. Um, could you put them uh, with a limited amount of rage? Um, we've got upstairs a microphone. Steve's got the microphone there. I've got one here. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I was interested to hear you talk about uh, ethical confusion, anger as aggression that needs to be controlled, anger as a deadly sin and so on. But I didn't hear anyone talk about this notion we have as a society of righteous anger, where um, something is deservedly uh, making us angry, where we have an obligation to intervene, to blame the other person and put a stop to that behaviour. I'm just wondering whether that confusion makes your job more difficult. Righteousness. Mm. Andrew. Uh, moral anger is very important, <coughs> um, something I experienced myself, as we were talking about earlier before today. And uh, I, think, I think there is neglect it, um, but it's, it's an, an instance or a circumstance in which anger is legitimate, uh, motivates and energises us to overcome wrongdoing. And I think most people can think about situations where they'd be morally outraged um, about things that happen in the world, and that would motivate them to try and do something to make amends for that. From what you were saying, it is implied it's almost like a sort of social mechanism where someone is manipulating a crowd. Well, not sorry, not necessarily, but I, I was particularly thinking when we were talking about prisoners, when you're trying to convince them it's not right for them to change, and yet as a society we might often be giving... Uh, a message, you know, it's right to, inter to be angry by bullying or an injustice. You should mm -hmm. intervene, you should stop it. How do you get that societal message um, differentiated from the message you're trying to give an individual mm -hmm. who sees that he's just acting in the same way? Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, it, I guess that I'd go back to the, this division I made in my talk between morality and ethics, that um, what I try to work with in boys that I treat is inculcate them with an ethics of self-interest. Uh, that if they do end up punching all of their schoolmates and uh, getting expelled to school, from school, that will be detrimental to their self-interest. And whereas imposing a morality from outside, often with angry people, is very unhelpful in the treatment of anger. Now, your question seemed to be more broadly about when are we right to be morally angry? I don't know that's a question I, as a clinical psychologist, is um, qualified to answer. But what I am qualified to say is that I think being moral with angry people tends to be unhelpful in their treatment. Enforcing a morality on them is unhelpful. Encouraging them to discover their own ethical stance <coughs> tends to be far more helpful for those who are able to do that. Have you sometimes seen a demagogue manipulate a crowd and use anger control them? Absolutely. It happens in every single group I, I uh, treat, that there is a demagogue, a bully, a, le a ruthless leader who seem, seems to be able to threaten, to be able to uh, say things more extreme, be more ruthless than all the others. And that has to be confronted within the groups because uh, as soon as power relations emerge, as I said before, speech disappears. And in the place of power relations, what I try to encourage is communications, that I try to put the power relation into words. If the boys in the group won't do it, then I will name it for the group and mm. just leave it there like a ticking bomb <laughs> and come back to it. Mm. Please, at the back. Yeah. I'll come to you in a minute. Thank you. My question is, in regards to giving sugar, how does that relate to treatment for people like ADHD and those sort of things, preservatives, food colouring, all that sort of stuff? Does it lead down the same path of extreme behaviour? Yeah, that's, that's a lot of people ask me about that. That's actually one of the biggest myths around is that sugar will actually make people more hyperactive or impulsive. That's actually not true. There's very little data out there that even remotely support that. But it's a big sort of myth and people think that, you know. So I thought, you yeah. see it in a shopping centre, a kid, if he doesn't get a lolly or a chocolate, boom, snap. Well, well that's maybe because they want the lolly or the... <laughs> 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 it's not yeah. the sugar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Holding the sugar, so he knows he enjoys the chocolate, he gets the sugar rush and the sweetness, so therefore he behaves in such a fashion until he gets that again. Uh, but maybe, uh, I mean, I would, you could also say the opposite, that it would calm him down, right, if you got the... So could it be the colourings and the flavourings? in the sweets and the drinks. You know, I don't, I lo I don't know about the, that. I, my sense is no, um, but I, I don't know any data. I haven't looked at those data, but yeah. Uh, I have a question with uh, the treatment of prisoners. How do you account for comorbidities like 
alcohol abuse, drug abuse, um, things like other mental health issues that people that you might be treating may be experiencing. You don't necessarily have a healthy um, non-clinical population when you're trying mm -hmm. to do these interventions. How do you deal with those you know, contributing factors mm. when you're doing treatment like you do? I, I think that's one of the problems with having very na narrow interventions mm. that are focused on anger. And these days people would have substance use components in uh, much more kind of wide sweeping or broad brush kind of interventions. Obviously um, substance use problems relate to impulsivity and relate to self-regulation of emotional behaviour. Um, mental health issues can really affect people's uh, willingness and ability to engage in a behaviour change process and um, if people are preoccupied with their ex internal experience and often treatment is delivered in groups so it requires a, a kind of a certain level of um, I guess confidence in groups, a certain level of dis self disclosure and an ability to talk emotionally um, for treatment to be effective. So there are really important issues in delivering effective treatment. There's one over here, wasn't it? You talked about uh, looking at uh, a general morality as such when you're dealing with angry people as being ineffective as opposed to a personal ethical approach in, in their self-interest. If you look at the education system, the way anger is approached with children is all around the general morality. And you can almost see this is where all the effort's going. It's, it's quite intensive in terms of time uh, and money commitment that you can almost see the children glaze over in the first four seconds as soon as you start to mention it, like they're basically not there. Yes. And, and, and to me, it's completely ineffective. So finding another way, another approach would be uh, very useful. So what would you see as an institution the best way to, to deal with that? Um, I mean, I will say that uh, to credit schools, um, Schools tend to work on a behaviour consequences model. If you do this, then this will happen. And that works for most people. Um, schools, dis despite um, reports to the contrary, aren't becoming the seething mass of angry unrest. Actually, the, all the statistics are that the amount of violence and aggression in schools has, re has remained pretty constant over the last few decades. Um, what my point is, is for those people who have trouble with anger, taking a moral approach doesn't work. Although, it, as you say, that's what tends to happen, that um, the more a boy's angry and aggressive, the more a girl's angry and aggressive, the more they become marginalised and um, uh, treated as if they're the evil one. Whereas uh, my approach is very much about trying to inculcate an ethical approach rather than a moral one, and that is in the normal um, course of events, what an adolescent ach an adolescence achieves, that the child's told not to cross the traffic lights, and the child understands that solely because that's what the parents said. Whereas adults, well, people might have their own reasons for stopping at traffic lights or jaywalking. And an adolescence is a time where those sort of reasons for obeying the law are questioned and played out. Upstairs at all? One. Steve, feel free yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have a little bit of a think about it, right? Down here, yes, okay. Um, I'd like to confer sainthood on um, mm. Andrew over here, working in prisons. I think it's remarkable. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Seriously, doing, doing this remarkable job. Uh, but uh, my question is really for Michael, because I have been a teacher for a long time. I think what you're doing also is remarkable, wonderful. Thank you. And it seemed to me that there were the two aspects to what you were talking about when you were speaking about helping young men specifically to acquire the tools initially of using their bodies, their kinesthetic energy, to actually uh, use it in a way to enlighten themselves, to gain insight into themselves, to help them use language to solve their problems instead of their fists and their violence. So it seemed to me that the first thing you were, you were teaching them was insight into themselves. Is the corollary to insight that of then empathy, seeing others and their point of view, so that you cannot then 
always blame outside circumstances, other people. But if you have insight into yourself and then develop empathy into others, that the whole issue of anger then changes. Yeah. Um, look, th there's a long history <coughs> of calling the sort of boys that I treat antisocial. Um, that is, they don't really understand how to be empathic and don't really understand how others feel and take on their perspective. Um, I, I think that, that term's a misnomer because I think if you go back to the example of Alan, his problem was not that he was antisocial, but that he was way too permeable to the social, to all these other expectations and things outside of him. My own view is that I think it's too much to ask. To, to, to ask these boys to be empathic. I think um, it's already a lot to ask for them just to practice what I call this ethics of self-interest, to try and get to the end of their adolescence with some sort of opportunity for their life still intact. That is a lot to ask of them. And that's, I guess, less of a Christian and more of perhaps a Nietzschean way of looking at um, life that what one does is one looks after oneself without damaging the, the, the um, opportunities and interests of others. But I think if you can achieve that with a, 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 the boys such as the ones I treat, you've done very, very well. Any last? Yes, two more, and then that's it. Thank you. Um, I'm just thinking Michael identified uh, that anger is about self-identity being challenged and, um, you know, n not wanting to be wrong about themselves. And then I thought back to what Andrew said, which I found to be a bit of a surprise, when he said men who are violent to women usually have high moral standards and would like the world to be the way they'd like it to be. And I, I, I instinctively had a bit of aversion to that mm -hmm. and I thought it might be some sort of self-justification. And I sort of thought what Michael said went in line with that and I'm just wondering when they see themselves as highly ethical or highly moral, are they in fact justifying behaviour that they have wrongly engaged in by feeling threatened? And perhaps both of you could comment on that. You want me to start? I, yeah. I, I guess my view is that people don't have um, high moral standards but they have strong moral rules. So they have um, strong beliefs about how people should and shouldn't be in the world. And often people, or men who are violent, um, experience abusive and traumatic personal histories. So a lot of domestically violent men grow up in families where domestic violence is a common experience. And that leaves them um, learning about some rules about when it's appropriate to express anger aggressively or violently. Um, and that's the way that they can control the world or, or manage um, circumstances. Coupled with that is this desire to make their families or their worlds um, perfect and safe. So men would see themselves as protectors and providers, for example, in families. Um, and when there's challenges to that, they get angry and they try and control that through aggressive behaviour. So that's kind of what I was trying to talk about in terms of that sense of entitlement or that sense of righteousness that gives, allows people to give themselves permission to act violently or aggressively to assert their will over another person. So, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to present present domestically violent men as morally um, sophisticated or superior, but people have very strong rules that really um, constrain the possibilities for acting in non-violent ways when they experience problems. Michael, Tom? Um, I, I think the assertion's right, that um, anger and morality are excellent bedfellows, and that uh, because morality is generally used as a way of trying to make, it's taken up for us to make someone else act in a particular way. Um, anger is always about blaming someone else and what they've done wrong according to what at that moment we see as a moral standard. So I think that assertion is correct. Whether that means angry people are moral, well I think we're all multiple aren't we? And when I'm, I'm not sure I know anyone more moral than me when I'm angry. <laughs> 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 but but with how I am now, I'm probably a real slack bum and I don't really care. So I, I think at different moments uh, I, I, I take a different stance on morality. I suppose I was thinking about the man who murdered his partner or yeah. ex-partner because he would no longer put up 
Pearson's behaviour mm. justifies it by saying she should have, um, you know, honoured the sanctity of marriage and stayed with him. Right. Well, well, I guess I, what I'd say in response to that, I don't know if it answers your question, is precisely the reason why I didn't go on and work with men like this. Mm. Mm. That I, I did work with them at one stage um, in, in a group setting with men who'd been convicted of, of battering their spouses. And I started by working with them by reading the charge sheets of what they'd done. And I, I found it very difficult for me to continue to work with them um, knowing what they'd done. And I ended up stop, stopping reading the charge sheets and um, then stopped working with them altogether, precisely because I found it extremely difficult to listen to these men and in the knowledge of seeing the full facts of the case of what they'd done, I think it's a very difficult place to, to work. I just add that I think it's really yes, important to emphasise that victims of violence are in no way responsible for that violence, even though that's what violent people will try and tell you about how they're provoked and how they have no, no options um, under those circumstances to behave in any other way. Um, it kind of relates to the previous question about empathy, and a lot of work that's done with offenders is trying to help people take the perspective of their victims. Um, and most offenders, I think, it's fair to say, will... Um, have an inability or will under empathise or have an ability, inability to take the perspective of the victim and what it was like to be in their shoes and, and clearly with gendered um, violence there's a huge discrepancy between um, the power, control and um, physicality of men and most gendered violence is men perpetrated on women and what it's like to be a victim of that violence. Last question over here. Thank you. Uh, this question is for Tom. Uh, you, you showed some slides where the brain activity sort of changes with anger. Um, I'm wondering whether that is the cause or the re reason, um, cause and effect. Is it the cause or is the effect? The reason I'm asking this question is uh, we discussed anger more in terms of reasoning, judgment, etc. Is the physiological reason that some people are more, uh, uh, can become more angry? That's the question I'm asking. Yeah, so, so I think, I'm not quite sure if this gets to your question, but I, I think we, we show that that activation happens after the anger induction, so after people were provoked. And that activation is largest for these people that have this sort of, these cognitive, um, uh, you know, uh, schemas about the world, these aggressive people, right? So people with high aggressive personality, they were also the most angry, they showed the most activation, Right, so these things are all highly correlated. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think what, what happened in that situation is you got the most activation for after the anger induction for aggressive people, essentially, right, who have those schemas. Right. Does that answer your question? Yeah, um, I mean, this is, for me, this is, these are all correlated, so I won't say that one is causing the other, but uh, I mean, what does it mean to say that if they score something on a personality and they show this brain activation, those things are probably identical, right? They just feel different, right? One is self-report, the other is physiological activity, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I think something like that is possible. Thank you, we do have one more question up there. Uh, that'll be the last one, thank um, you. You mentioned give them any examples of how to express their anger appropriately, like sentences or phrases? Um, no, I don't. But there's a couple of things I do. One is... Uh, look, the principle is that over the weeks of the group, because I work with boys, I try to work them twice a week in a group, and over the weeks of the group, boys very quickly show what their difficulties with anger is. So whether they're more like, say, Lawrence, who over-controls their anger, or whether they 
tend to just explode every session and cause problems for the group. And what, what we do is over a period of time in the group, we do uh, a program of uh, assessment and then re-intervention, assessment and re-intervention in the group, that we use the anger and aggression that in front of the deputy principal would result in exp exp expulsion from school for us. That is gold because here we are seeing the problem this boy is expressing right in front of us and it's an opportunity for us to keep on assessing and re-intervening, trying to really hone our intervention to the problem that the boy acts out in the group. Um, the second thing we do is sometimes we do what I at times call a bag of anger tricks that the group of boys gathers what I call a group nous, the knowledge of the group, where boys discover or stumble over ways of acting, ways of trying to make sure that this group, that all of a sudden, because it's this great group um, that they've, th um, they've discovered because they can drum and they love being part of it, they want to preserve this group. And so rather than causing the group to explode because they're hitting each other, they learn ways to try and preserve, to be in the group together. And I call that a bag of anger tricks. And at the end of the group, we might write those up and give them back to the boys so that they take away with them what I call a bag of anger tricks, ways of beating anger, let's say. Mm. They're, they're the two main things that I do. Thank you, Michael. And I'd like to finish under the spirit of the seven deadly sins, as if anger is a general sin and refer to my own trade, which is in the media. And it seems to me that the general shock jock approach to life is trying to make us more of an angry society than we've almost ever been yeah. in living memory. And I'm assuming this to be the case because my household gets cross <coughs> and lots of people I know get cross. And from what I read of the various measures taken by the pollsters. People are cross and they don't vote for governments that make things happen anymore. And when I look at the kind of blogified responses, it's projectile vomit everywhere. <laughs> Do you have that feeling about the so society we live in? I know I've only given you about 30 seconds to answer the question, but does it cross your mind at all, any of you? Uh, no, it doesn't. I, I think there's <laughs> There's a generalised nostalgia to the, to, for the past that things were happier, uh, we were able to live together, we're all, the world was full of love. And um, I don't think actually that was ever the case. I think we always had this problem of anger and aggression, but perhaps uh, what we're doing is getting more and more ways of trying to deal with it. But I don't think we've, the past was any less angry than it is now. Tom, we're not being manipulated. <laughs> oh, I think by the media, for sure, yes. <laughs> um, and it gets, it gets, it's, it's primordial, right? It gets a rise out of you, right? It's a basic emotion. So the advertising works the same way, right? Sex sells, right? It's the same kind of thing. So, yeah. You're not worried about the dangers there are? I don't think society is getting more aggressive, no. Andrew? Um, I think for me, anger is an intensely personal experience, and the focus of problematic anger is often in anger in interpersonal relationships. Um, so, I mean, I think the media can stir up moral outrage and political anger. That's a, that's a slightly different um, emotion and something that's less concerning, I think, in terms of its association with violence or aggressive behaviour. It's not making running society a more difficult thing. I think it probably is, yeah. Mm. Interesting. Thank you very much for coming and thank you for it. <laughs>